Ritten has three children, two littles that they adopted and a son who's a freshman in college. And he, uh, they homeschooled their oldest son. He has been in the classroom for 22 years. So what I wanna let you know about Renton, he has taught at all levels, high school, college, graduate school. He's taught in seminary. He has five master's degrees. Now let me tell you what these are in, um, speeding, uh, speech, writing, philosophy, and theology. And he just completed his PhD in um, theology and, and apologetics. So we couldn't have anybody better to speak to us than Renton on this whole idea of worldview. He is actually the world, one of the worldview specialists at BJU Press, where they do a lot of worldview weaving. So what you're about to hear is great news for us as believers who want to raise children who love Jesus and can minister to people in this dark and dying world. So without any further ado, let's bring Renton forward so that you can meet my friend. Good afternoon, Renton. Good afternoon, thanks for having me. Oh, it is so great to have you with us. And we are so excited about the prominence that the biblical worldview has in the BJU Press curriculum and what that means for moms who are trying to educate their kids to love Jesus. So could you just start by telling us how you developed your passion for biblical worldview studies? Oh, that's a good question. I'll, I think it started um, back uh, at 9-11. I remember sitting and watching the television, uh, looking at things I couldn't believe with my eyes. And for the first time, I think without knowing all of the words of like worldview and all that sort of thing, I saw two very different worlds collide. And it seemed so clear and black and white. And I remember as time went on, we had people that began to start saying that, you know, coming with these ideas that, um, you know, we deserved it, and we have these uh, professors in these universities uh, in America uh, saying how terrible America is, and that this, you know, we can't, we'd have to expect things like this to happen. I just remember thinking how strange that is, how we went from such something that seems so clear cut to something so, you know, strange that people would then find sympathy towards evil like that. And um, it motivated me to start thinking about these things. And that's what I, I think that's why the Lord led me to start uh, getting into uh, philosophy. So I started studying philosophy, trying to figure out what is the big secret that everyone uh, is using to try and understand the world. And what I found was uh, there is no secret in the philosophical world. Uh, Everyone's just kind of guessing with their assumptions. And uh, my wife was the one that said, you know, stop wasting your time with philosophy and go to seminary. And so I started, uh, I, started my work. <laughs> yeah. I started my work in philosophy or in uh, theology. And what I, what I saw was uh, in order for us to really think and really understand the world around us, we have to understand God's word. And we have to understand it in a word in a way that is um that is deep and even if I can put it this way, sophisticated, because the world has developed their sophisticated way of looking at the world and it has poisoned every aspect of our secular world, from entertainment down to education down to the brainwashing of our own children. And so I think uh, that is really what got me into this whole idea of what worldview means and how it affects the world around us. You know, that word poison is very, very powerful because mm -hmm. our, our world has become so secularized so quickly mm -hmm. in the last even 10 years. And um, and so they are our kids are being bombarded by podcast and and um, social media school everywhere you can imagine is anti God. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. Um, so uh, written, give us your definition of what a biblical worldview is. OK, so um, this is this is a word that's been used a lot, this idea of 
biblical worldview. Um, you know, it's kind of a way to get products sold nowadays. Uh, it's if you look in uh, in the in your aisle down the uh, in a grocery store, you see all natural on all kinds of uh, brand names and and items. And all natural is kind of that phrase that everyone kind of uses to get their product uh, purchased. Uh, what we found uh, is that. Uh, the word all natural really doesn't have a lot of meaning. There's not a lot of regulations with it. Um, like natural sugar. <laughs> yes, right. I mean, in fact, it's it's very possible you can put all natural on a Kit Kat bar and it's perfectly legal. And uh, I think the same thing kind of has happened to biblical worldview. Uh, no one has, you know, there hasn't been many people that have really placed their definition on it and gave it a regulated view so that when people see that, they expect certain things from it instead of just seeing it and then feeling comforted by that phrase and then looking at the and purchasing uh, materials. So a biblical worldview, um, before we answer that, we need to know what a worldview is in the first place. And Typically, a lot of people um, have defined worldview by saying, well, it's a set of beliefs and values that we use uh, to try and understand the world around us. And that's true, uh, but that's only part of the story. Um, yes, we use our beliefs, assumptions, and values to understand the world around us, but those beliefs, values, and assumptions have to be in a context. Otherwise, they make no sense to us. So what is the context? Well, the context is the story we live in. And what is that story? I mean, and I know this kind of sounds, um, I don't know if it sounds simplistic or not, but I mean, even when you study uh, science, uh, even on the secular level, they don't just give you facts and data points and things like that. They have to develop it inside a story. That even if you're going to try and push the Big Bang on somebody, it has to start with a story. So, you know, where did the Big Bang come from? Well, now they have this theory that long, long time ago in a land far, far away, there was this massive universe that's really huge. And there was a part uh, of the universe that wasn't developed yet. And so through time, space, and um, quantum mechanical uh, events, we have this explosion that started this particular universe within a much larger universe. And then we tell the story about how, you know, one rock was close enough to a star and it cooled down and it had atmosphere, which, you know, caused it to have water. It was, it's a story. Uh, none of That's it is right. based on science. It's a story to make the data points that they want the students to believe have meaning and how we have to work because that's how God made our minds. God made our minds story minds. And so our story mind needs that context. And so the real question is, where does my beliefs and values and assumptions even come from? Well, they come from my story. And what is that story? And a biblical worldview says your story is understood through God's word. Hmm. Amen. And that God's word uh, <clears throat> began with an, this event that makes no sense to theologians anywhere. The fact that a God who is completely happy, completely satisfied, if we can put it that way, completely content within himself, decided to create makes no sense because there was nothing he was lacking. There was nothing he needed. He wasn't curious about anything because he knowledge was was him there wasn't there is nothing uh, outside of him that he's curious about so he decided to create and he created man and he created man in his own image but then man fell and that happens within the first 3 chapters of scripture the rest of scripture from genesis 3 onwards is all about God's redemption of his people. Amen. Amen. And so what we see is this pattern that scripture has shown us in uh, that our story is within that redemption 
uh, part where Christ, the Son of God, has come to redeem his people. We are part of that people, and we see this pattern all throughout creation where we see this creation that God has made. We see a part of it that has fallen, and we can see how God is redeeming his creation. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at that, that becomes, through the, through the power and through the foundation of Scripture itself, becomes the worldview that we have to, and I'm going to put it this way, and this is something that a lot of people leave out of biblical worldview. We need this biblical worldview to interpret the world. Now, Amen. That's right. Now, what's amazing about this is that in order to interpret the world, we have to ask ourselves, are we the interpreters of the world or has it been already interpreted? And what we find is God's word is God's interpretation of the world for us, that we might think his thoughts after him. How do you think God's thoughts after him? You look at his word as he has interpreted the world using models that you see in scripture like creation, fall, and redemption to look at the world, to see the world as God has told us to understand it. Now that is a biblical worldview. Yes, yes, it is. And, you know, I want to tell you just very briefly my own worldview journey story, because I think it helps us to understand why this is so important for homeschool moms. I grew up in the church. I became a believer, a Christian when I was in high school through the ministry of Young Life. And then I was involved in a college Bible study where we were up at five and six meeting for prayer and Bible study and sharing our faith on campus. I mean, we were a serious group of believers. But I'll never forget when I sat in, um, I was an economics major. I was headed for law school and had no concept as a Christian that God might be calling me to something different as a woman. And um, so through some just some miraculous leading of God, I ended up getting married and having a family right away after I graduated from Furman. But at, when my son was a baby, we listened to Francis Schaeffer um, and his How Should We Then Live video series. And I remember, I can't remember if it was Dr. Schaefer or whether it was our pastor saying there's a biblical worldview of everything. Now, I understood my story and I understood, I didn't understand the word worldview, but I knew that the Bible uh, had implications for all the moral decisions I made and the life decisions I made. But when my pastor or Dr. Schaefer said there is a biblical worldview perspective on economics in every academic discipline, I thought, no, there's not, because somebody in the church, somebody would have told me that by now I'm 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And so as I listened to him and I understood that God had something to say about everything and his word had something to say about everything, not just big life decisions, which are important, not just what I learn in my devotions which what that are important, but every academic discipline out there. Mm -hmm. And so I just have to tell you that in coming uh, to Homeworks by Precept and BJU Press curriculum, I feel like I've come home mm. because there's finally a curriculum for us moms having to teach all these subjects and we can begin. I mean, I felt like I had to learn, unlearn everything I had ever learned because mm. I never wanted my children to go through that. Mm. So now children's, children and moms can learn together through this curriculum is so well done academically, but it tells that story you're referring to. Mm. So, um, Renton, I want you to talk to us for a minute um, about just is the Bible a textbook and how do we learn from Scripture what it says about academics? Oh, that's great. Let me uh, use an example that might seem uh, difficult to understand. So, um, how this might work. So, um, Let's take math. Um, what would be a biblical worldview of math? How is it that scripture can steer how we teach our children math? Well, what's interesting about math is that it's one of the few things that we try to teach children without ever telling them what the components of it really are. For instance, we want kids to understand math without ever telling them what a number is. 
Now, I know that not a lot of people know what a number is because in the philosophical world, they are still arguing over it. 2021, <laughs> they still are arguing over what a number is. But you got to understand, it is a hard question because uh, when you think of a number, what you're really thinking of is the symbol that stands for the number. So in most of your minds, you might be thinking of the number one. But you're not really thinking of the number one. You're thinking of that symbol that you know looks like how we recognize what one is. But we really don't know what the number is. And we kind of ignore that and say, okay, well, let's not worry about all that. Let's just start adding things and subtracting things and things like that. Well, it's not just a philosophical question because eventually, uh, especially homeschool kids are inquisitive. They don't have a big classroom where they get to hide be, hide or be embarrassed to ask questions. They're asking the people that care about them the most every question that comes to their head. And one of them, especially when it comes to math, is why does this matter? Who cares? Um, right. <laughs> and so answering the question of what a number is is actually a biblical question. We have to understand that when Adam was created, he was created to be an image bearer of God. So he was to mimic his creator. His creator created the world and then named Adam. And then God actually, as he does, rules over the earth, but also he subdued it by separating the waters from the land and things like that. And I know this doesn't sound like we're talking about math yet, but we'll get there. And so, he, uh, and so God does these things. He subdues the world, he rules over the world, and he some of his ruling and subduing is by naming, as he named Adam. And so then he tells Adam to do that. He commands him, subdue the world, rule over the world. And so Adam names the animals. But what other kind of naming is there? Is it possible that part of our subduing, to obey God's command, to subdue and rule over the earth, we need to do some naming of quantity. And to, in order to understand what a number is, what we're really understanding is the way we are naming quantity as a way of obeying a commandment to rule and subdue the, the earth as image bearers of God, knowing that part of God's work of ruling is sub, and subduing is naming. And be able to name a, a, a quantity is a way that we are, and it sounds weird, but we're image bearing. Uh, it's a fascinating thing that we could teach our kids. This isn't just some arbitrary thing we do so that we can get through this curriculum because we've got to get through this before lunch. Um, and that's fine. But it's also important for the kids to understand even math is a way of, of bearing God's image as using the tools he's given us, these models uh, that we call math, to help us subdue the world as obedience to him. So actually, in a weird way, learning math from a biblical worldview is part of obeying God because we're trying to subdue and rule over the earth as he's commanded us to do. You know, that is so powerful. And so the other side I see in the biblical worldview shaping in the BJU Press curriculum is first we start with this, that it's our cultural mandate or dominion mandate that mm -hmm. we, we subdue and rule the earth. And I've never thought about it that way in terms of math. And mm -hmm. then also I see in our math curriculum examples of people using mathematical careers to serve their neighbors. Mm. And I just think that's so glorious, too, because our the two most important things we can do and teach our kids is to love God and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. Mm. And so if you've got, you know, so I know there's so many, the theology is practical and then the working out of it in our everyday life is practical. And so if you had to say, is the Bible a textbook? Or, because people ask me that all the time. How do you answer that question in a minute and a half? Okay. So I would answer that question very simply. God's word is what makes all textbooks possible. So it is the textbook of all textbooks. 
if there is no scripture, there is no other way of learning things because we could guess at, through Ooh. human observation, we could guess through our, our assumptions, but until you have God's word to be able to say, this is how God has interpreted the world and wants us to see his world, we have nothing to look back on to check our work, if I can put it that way. So does scripture, you know, give us the components of a cell? No, it doesn't give us components of a cell. But it is through scripture that studying the components of a cell has any meaning whatsoever and tells us what the source of the life of a cell is and tells us who is the one that holds those pieces of that cell together. It is Christ himself. And through that, we see real critical thinking skills because what we find is that merely vomiting data back out at at the parents is not real learning. Real learning is knowing that that those that data that you're getting has a a source and has a purpose. Source and purpose is the is the way that critical thinking really wraps around the data that turns from merely regurgitating ideas to really understanding the ideas that you're learning. You know, that is so great because that really hits at one of the other hearts of the BJU Press curriculum, which is critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that people with a biblical worldview learn to think more critically than anybody else I know. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, we're, we're reasoning from scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Renton, I've got a few more questions for us. Tell us what biblical worldview shaping is and what you do with the curriculum as a biblical worldview specialist. Okay, so the difference um, that we want to make, um, there was a term really early in the biblical worldview uh, span where people were saying we want biblical integration. Um, and, and that's an okay word, but what it implies, it doesn't mean this is what it does, but what it implies is that somewhere in your curriculum, you're going to shove scripture in there the best you can and try and add scripture to uh, your curriculum. So what it, the reason why this would uh, oftentimes depress the parents is that they're like, you know, I'm doing all I can to get through all this work and trying to get the kid just to understand everything uh, that they need to understand in a timely manner. And now you want to add and try and push some scripture in there. And the problem with that, you know, that kind of thinking actually makes a uh, biblical worldview less uh, convincing. Uh, because what you do is you start getting, um, you start making connections that aren't really there. Um, you might say, I mean, a really horrible example would be something like, well, you know, of course, scripture speaks of math because there were, you know, there's a book called the book of numbers. And so, you know, uh, the scripture is very interested in numbers. Uh, and so, you know, and sometimes they're not that bad, but sometimes they can get bad because you're just trying to figure out how can I shove scripture into this? Biblical worldview shaping is designed to, in a very natural way, help students understand that what they are learning is rooted in the model God has given us in Scripture. And not only is it rooted there, but you can understand your subject better by understanding the biblical worldview. So it's not that the biblical worldview is this extra thing that is tagged on a few extra questions at the end. But biblical worldview is actually designed to help them understand their material better. So, you know, in, in creation, fall, and redemption model, you know, what is, you know, we just talked about the creational view of math, where it, it solves the problem of being able to obey God's commandment of subduing and ruling over the earth. But what has happened in the fall? Well, you have people saying, no, math is a human idea. It's a human thing, and this is where a guy named Bertrand Russell comes in, and a guy named uh, Frege comes in and says, no, this is human thinking, and humans are the ones that interpret the world. There is no God that it's interpreted the world. Humans interpret the world because they're the ones that came up with math, and they came up with this idea come logic, logicism and everything like that. 
Well, as we see how that fall comes into place, well, how do we redeem it back to understand, to bring it back to what Scripture has told us it is? Well, that's the redemption model. And so we can already see we're learning ideas that wrap around the practicality of math to help us understand the world of math. It helps us understand the trajectory of math, helps us understand where math, people have taken math in wrong turns, and that math does have a worldview. And if we ignore it, the world will not. And they will definitely try and teach a worldview through math. You can already see how math has been used all over politics to try and get people to believe whatever they want people to believe. Truth or falsity uh, has nothing really to do with it. So you can see um, how shaping the student in a biblical worldview shapes their thinking. And when their thinking is shaped through Scripture, we can rely on the promises of Scripture that Scripture uh, is that which, through the work of the Holy Spirit, changes the heart. And we don't want to just change the brain. We want to change the heart. And that is where the Holy Spirit works if Scripture is your foundation. Amen. Boy, that's powerful. So let me just say this. We're coming up on two. So you moms who need to go and get back with your kids, do that. Renton and I are going to keep talking for a few more minutes. And you can always come back and listen to the end later. As a matter of fact, even though I've heard Burton or Renton speak and I've written some thing, I've read some things he's written, I find myself trying to take notes. And then I thought, I'm going to quit taking notes. Listen, come back, listen again and take my notes then. So let me encourage you to do that. So Renton, um, one of my dear friends is Ann Miller. She is the president of HEAV, which is the very large um, and sound homeschooling organization in Virginia. Every year at their conference pre-COVID, they would have between 16 and 18,000 people. Mm -hmm. And she heard you speak at the BJU Press Homeschool Foundation Summit last year. And you said something that she talks about every time she gets uh, to the podium. We were um, BJ uh, Homeworks by Precept and BJU Press Homeschool just sponsored their Virginia Leadership Conference. And she got up and talked about hearing you speak last year and how we're missing the boat because we're teaching apologetics, maybe not in the best way, and giving our kids pat answers or slim answers or thin answers so that when they get to college, even with some apologetics, and I'm not dissing apologetics, I know it has its place, but they get to, to college and these professors eat their lunch. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the difference in the way we view apologetics, how apologetics should be viewed and how that's a little bit different than worldview shaping. I guess what I wanna get at is what can we do to make our kids those who, when they get to college, aren't just torn out of the frame of their faith mm. by these secular um, philosophers who are going to make it their goal to de derail Christians? Yes, that's an excellent question. We, we care about our children, and we know the world wants them. Um, I, I taught for 15 years in the secular universities and colleges, and I can tell you the secular professor um, is an evangelist for secularism. And I'll even say, even for those, for our children that leave our uh, homeschooling world and just immediately go off into, into work, um, into, the, into whatever field they, they want, we, it doesn't hide them from the sophisticated bombardment of um of the world upon their faith and so we have to prepare them and so part of that preparation um we we be, we begin to start thinking well how do i prepare someone to defend the faith well we automatically start thinking well apologetics and unfortunately a lot of publishers have made a lot of money by trying to come up with these well-reasoned arguments and uh um and some ar uh, archaeological things that are nice little things to have in your pocket. So when the secular professor or someone from the world says, hey, I don't see any proof of this or I don't see any proof of that, uh, you can pull out your little, uh, 
you know, little ideas of, of um, apologetics and, and try and use it. Well, this is the problem. Uh, this is the big, uh, the big secret in the apologetical world. In apologetics, uh, I think most people don't know what, what it is. And so when biblical worldview comes along, they start to get confused that they think, well, biblical worldview and apologetics, it's kind of the same thing. But it's not. Um, so I'll put it this way. An apologetic is a method. There are many different kinds of methods to try and defend the faith. And that's what apologetics is. There are particular methods uh, that are put into use to try and defend the faith. But this is the issue. Which method should you use? Uh, there's really bad methods. There's really good methods. Um, how do you know? Um, and unfortunately, we don't know. And so we might be employing a really bad method. We don't know why it's bad. We don't know that it's a bad method. But we it sounds really good, and it seems convincing, and it kind of gives us some satisfaction when we, when we look at it. And so we start giving it to our kids. Um, so this is how we try and understand these things. A biblical worldview, or if I can put it this way, a worldview tells you how to interpret the world around you. That's what a worldview does. So if a worldview is designed to interpret the world around you, it gives you the understanding and knowledge of how I understand the world. That will inform what method of apologetic you will use. It will inform you what you think the problem is. So let me challenge uh, your listeners with this. When we ask the question, what is the problem when people have unbelief? Um, I can tell you that scripture, a biblical worldview, will tell you what the real problem is. Um, Romans 1.18 tells us what the problem is. It says that God's wrath is kindled against man because man is ungodly. He's filled with unrighteousness. And what he does, what man has done, is he uses his unrighteousness to suppress the truth. He suppresses this truth in unrighteousness. Now, this tells us two things. Number one, he knows the truth. Scripture tells us man doesn't, it's not that he just knows of a God, he knows the God, because in, in 19 and 20 it tells us that God has made it plain to them. They know God, okay, and they, and they know uh, a lot about him just by looking at the world. But they suppress that truth and unrighteousness. So when we think of apologetics and what kind of a method we would use, we have to think, what's the problem with unbelief? Is it that their reason is askew and we have to fix their reason so that they will then believe? Is it that they don't know enough about archaeology, so we got to tell them more about archaeology so that then they will believe? Is it that they don't understand enough about uh, the philosophical milieu of the world, and if they understood that better and saw how Christianity is very reasonable, then they would believe? Is that the problem? Well, biblical worldview says that's not the problem. They already know the truth, and they're suppressing the truth. So what is the need? The need is to hear the word of God, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the heart is broken, and that's where repentance and faith comes in. And so when you start thinking of apologetics, you think in those terms, what kind of apologetic follows that biblical worldview that I have, where I'm interpreting the world as God has told me to interpret it, that even though it seems, as you look out in the world, there's people that as we say, don't know God, Scripture says they do, and that they are suppressing it. And that's where we begin. So what I'm trying to show is that a biblical worldview informs what kind of apologetics you need to, uh, to, to even utilize in the first place. Because this is something I, I, I really wish a lot of homeschoolers would understand. Apologetics and biblical worldview and all of that isn't merely so we can prepare our kids to, en to engage atheists out there. 
I'll tell you this, there's not as many atheists as you would think. There's a lot of religious people <laughs> and a lot of secular people that have some religious, uh, you know, pieces to their world. The person that they're going to be preaching to the, the most of the time in their life is going to be themselves. As they come across times in their lives where they start struggling with unbelief, where friends that they know who uh, run away, um, I have seen this over and over, and this happens usually, you know, kids that are going to school, but it happens to homeschoolers sometimes, where kids are running away with a boyfriend or girlfriend, they have rejected the faith, and they come up with these questions that then poison the kids that have not uh, run away from the faith, but those questions kind of pick at their brain, and it, it kind of bothers them, and it doesn't seem like they're getting answers. And I'm telling you, yes, apologize can help you with that, but a biblical worldview gives them the foundation to be able to preach to themselves, to know God's word, to say, wait a minute, doesn't God's word say something about this? Because that's where the power is. The power is, oh, go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying that's such a perfect illustration because unfortunately we live in a world of Christian celebrity mm -hmm. and, you know, so forgive the terms, but there are the, all these famous Christians who are deconverting and yeah. deconstructing their faith. And it can, you know, it can rock the world of some of the people in, in their flocks or in their social media camp or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is so powerful to remember for our kids. And it's such a powerful reminder of why we need to be people of the word. Absolutely. And we might not always give every answer right, but I believe that as long as we're saturated in God's word and we're seeking first his kingdom, that God will lead us. And then thank the Lord for people like you and the BJU Press curriculum that is also, instead of fighting against us during the educational process, is not only working with us, but educating us too in the process. It's just a, a powerful, powerful, powerful marriage. Right? And I just can't thank you enough for your work. We're so thankful for BJU Press. We are so thankful um, for you and your faithfulness to God and his word. Is there anything we need to wrap up in just a minute? Is there anything you want to say to homeschool moms about what they're doing or um, just that the Lord has put on your heart before we leave? Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would end this way. Um, I think, uh, and this is what my wife and I uh, learned very quickly, is we live in a world in which there is very little encouragement to the homeschool mm -hmm. mom. Um, even we husbands um, have a tendency to see homeschooling as a problem solved. Uh, I have my job. I got things I got to do. Oh, wife has the kids taken care of. Good. Don't have to think about that anymore. And um, even your spouse uh, sometimes forgets the kind of work that homeschooling really is and how the world does not want to respect it because if they understood the power of homeschooling, uh, it would destroy public education. Um, and so, you know, the, the world hates it. Christians uh, sometimes don't quite understand it. And sometimes even our own family um, isn't as, uh, doesn't think about it enough to understand the kind of work that's going into it because you are doing the research to find the right curriculum because you love your kids. You're doing the, the work it takes to teach and go beyond your teaching uh, and make sacrifices. Some of you are uh, decide, have decided that I could put my kid in, the, in school and go on with a career, but I don't wanna do that because this is my work. And I'm telling you that even if the world and even sometimes their own family doesn't recognize that, God is blessing it. And sometimes we don't even see it uh, within the within years, <laughs> even after they're gone. Uh, we may not see it right away, but I am telling you, God's blessing is on that. 
and there is a work that's being done that cannot be copied in in the in the kind of traditional schooling that we think of uh, because the greatest instructor that a student can have is their parents. Oh.